I was like sucked in. So I'm like, Good afternoon, everyone, and sorry for delaying uh, you today. Start with some opening comments before I turn to questions. Starting around 1230 Eastern Time today, Iran launched nearly 200 ballistic missiles against a number of targets in Israel. The United States once again came to Israel's defense against these attacks, just as we participated in Israel's defense when Iran launched its April 13th attack. Our initial assessment is that Israel, with direct assistance from the United States and its partners, was able to successfully defeat this attack. This was a brazen, unacceptable attack by Iran, and every nation in the world must join us in condemning it. Secretary Blinken joined President Biden, Vice President Harris, and other members of the President's national security team in monitoring this attack as it was unfolding, uh, as well as our response. As the President has made clear, our support for Israel's security is ironclad. We will continue to stand with the people of Israel at this critical moment. That, that. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think this probably goes without well saying, just to make sure. So in terms of what happened in the real day, no damage any U.S. facilities, no injuries, no nothing. At this time, we are not aware of any damage to U.S. facilities. As you know, we um, issued an order earlier today for our personnel, uh, State Department personnel in Israel, to uh, shelter at their homes. Uh, we have full accountability for our, all our personnel. We're not aware of any um, uh, of any civilian casualties inside Israel. There, uh, uh, let alone a, uh, an American citizen casualty. There is one report of a Palestinian who died in the West Bank, uh, but no, no, um, no damage to any U.S. facility either. And then both you and the National Security Advisor, Mr. Kuhn, is going to talk about the thing that's raising an unacceptable escalation. Um, but does the administration see anything that Israel has done over the course of the last three weeks of escalatory? Yeah, so certainly they have done things um, uh, to, uh, ex to expand the conflict. But if you look at the actions that they have taken, they were bringing terrorists to justice, terrorists who have launched attacks on Israeli civilians. If you look at what Iran did today, we've been warning for some time about the threat posed by Iran arming and funding terrorist groups across the Middle East. And the attack today just demonstrated the danger of those actions. What you saw was Iran launching a state-on-state -state attack to protect and defend the terrorist groups that it has built, nurtured, and that it controls. So there is a difference between the actions uh, that we have yeah, seen Israel no, take to defend its civilians and what we see. I just what, and what we've seen Israel Iran take. They are equivalent. I just wanted to make sure that you didn't see. No, you, we have certainly seen Iran, or sorry, we've certainly seen Israel expand the nature of its attacks against Hezbollah, but it is a very different is a very different type of attack than what we saw today from a state a state actor against another state. Okay, and then, uh, last one, and this has to do with Lebanon and the Northern Front. Um, the situation there. Um, is you know, unstable and uh, uncertain. I know that you guys have been um, uh, asking Americans who might want uh, information about assistance and possibly leaving to sign up uh, on a form. Can you give us an update on the numbers of those and what they're not really finding to, um, to, to, to do anything in the way of the U.S. government um, uh, capabilities for further flights or ferries. Sure. So uh, you're right. As we often do in these situations, we have directed U.S. citizens who are in Lebanon to register with the State Department uh, for information, and especially for information with uh, 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 how to depart Lebanon, and we're providing them whatever information we can. We have had uh, as of today, around 6,000 American citizens in Lebanon who have registered with us uh, for further information. Should be clear, not all of those American citizens uh, are seeking assistance with departing. People are just looking for information. They're looking for options. There are a number of American citizens who live in Lebanon who have lived there for years and, and do not want to, to depart the country. Um, so in terms of the status on the ground, the airport is still open. Commercial flights are operating, although they are available uh, at times at reduced capacity. 
We are working right now with airlines to provide additional flights with more seats for American citizens. Uh, it's something that we hope to turn on in the next few days, and we will be in touch with American citizens uh, uh, if and when we're able to expand that capability. How do you how do you make how, how do you ensure that the seats reserved for America? No, we're working with uh, I can't get into the details, but we're working with commercial carriers to ensure that capability. And when we have further information and we've locked this down, it's something we'll communicate directly with American citizens who have asked for information. And then I'll be happy to come and talk with it, talk about it here at the briefing room. Thanks. Yeah. So, given that um, the secretary and the national security advisor just said that this attack by Iran is sort of definitive, definitively escalatory in nature, I know that state. You've been telling us, the Secretary even told us that for months they've you've been encouraging the Israelis not to respond to attacks and provocations in such a way that escalates anything further. Are, is the Secretary going to continue to to offer that same advice to the Israelis now in the wake of the right? I'll say a couple of things about, about that. First, of course, Israel has the right to defend itself, as any nation does. In terms of what Israel's response will be, of course, there must be consequences for Iran for this attack. We've made clear that, that there must be consequences. Um, I'm not going to get into what those consequences uh, are today, but there are things on which we will be coordinating with our Israeli counterparts. And I think in the immediate aftermath of this attack, um, we are going to coordinate with them on what any response might be. Uh, I think it's important that we are able to defeat this attack. Uh, through successful work with Israel uh, and with our partners, and we will work with them on what a response might look like, but I'm not at the position just, you know, two and a half hours after this event occurred to offer what that might look like today. The Iranian foreign ministry people have said that um, now that they gave the U.S., I don't know who, a heads up in advance of these missile strikes today through diplomatic channels. Is that true? That is absolutely false. We had no no kind of uh, warning from the government of Iran that they were going to launch such an attack. Um, given, you know, you're not going to detail what the consequences are going to look like yet. Understandably, you guys are in conversations with the Israelis about that. Um, can you give us a sense for how U.S. officials are thinking about this right now um, in terms of magnitude of a response? Will it be more severe than the U.S. response to the Iranian attack on Israel in April, given your... So I think it's too early to get into what the response might be. As I said, we're just a couple hours after this event having occurred. It's important that all of us inside the United States be able to take stock of the attack, be able to take stock uh, of what occurred. As I said, there are initial assessments, but we need time to, to collect all of the information, and then we need time to talk with our Israeli counterparts, and we need time to talk to other partners in the region uh, about the way forward, and we'll do that over the coming days. But it is clear that um, this was once again a significant escalation by Iran. When you see Iran launching attacks on another state, ultimately to come to the defense of a terrorist organization, uh, it is an escalation. Israel has the right to defend itself. Um, but we will coordinate with them uh, on what any response looks like. How much more worried are you about a regional war today than you were in previous days before this attack occurred? So I I've gotten that question a number of times over the past year, and I never want to try uh, and calibrate our level of concern only to say, or, or, or other, other than, than to say, say that, that Preventing the outs outbreak of a full-scale regional conflagration has been one of our priorities since October 7th. Uh, it's something that we immediately identified uh, was a risk after Hamas launched its brutal attacks on Israel and something that we have been working to prevent. There have been a number of times uh, in the past 12 months where it looked like we might reach such a, conf a conflagration. <laughs> April 13th is one of them, uh, quite obviously. And the United States, through a comb combination of deterrence and diplomacy, has been able to prevent such an outbreak of full-scale war. And we will continue to try and prevent an out outbreak of full-scale war in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, just a few more questions. Um, is Israel, excuse me, is Iran's nuclear program a legitimate target for an Israeli response? Uh, again, I don't want to get into, uh, and this is not to either, uh, this is not to, to say that I'm ruling anything uh, out and that I'm ruling anything in, but I would answer any question this way, which is, um, 
we want to have these conversations directly with our Israeli counterparts over the coming days. It's clear that this was an unacceptable attack, and uh, as we made clear before this attack, there will be consequences for it. But I think it's appropriate that we discuss those consequences with our Israeli counterparts uh, before we talk about them publicly. Any other countries involved in defending Israel alongside the United States? Uh, there were partners, uh, as I said in my opening comments, um, uh, who assisted in the defense of Israel. I will let all, all of those partners speak to their own actions. And last question, is the attack over as far as the U.S. assessment? Is Certainly this initial wave of an attack is over, which is not to say uh, that there are other waves coming or that there, uh, 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 you know, uh, is it not to say that there are other waves coming. We saw an initial attack earlier today uh, against the state of Israel. Uh, certainly it would be incredibly reckless and would continue to be escalatory were Iran to launch further attacks on Israel and we'll be monitoring, uh, uh, we'll be monitoring in the hours ahead. There have been a lot of parallels drawn between the Iran's attacks on Israel we saw in April and what happened today. But a big difference is that back in the spring, Iran did message for weeks the kind of attack it was going to carry out against Israel, as opposed to this time around, it seemed to be very sudden by comparison. Uh, that lack of uh, warning, public messaging, do you read into that? Is there any diplomatic significance? You know, I don't want to try to make assessments about why Iran made the decisions it made or why it um, kind of telegraphed them publicly last time and didn't do so this time. Obviously, we had some indication that an uh, attack might be in the works. You saw us talking about that. Um, we, we made clear, uh, uh, we gave warnings to our Israeli counterparts parts about it earlier today, and I think they came and, and read out some of those conversations publicly. So we had indications um, that there may be so, uh, some such attack. I can't speak to why they made the decision to not telegraph it as publicly as they did last time. It doesn't change the fundamental nature of the attacks, which is that this was an unacceptable uh, and brazen action uh, by the state of Iran. I know you want to have conversations with your Israeli counterparts about what their response will be, but can you say anything about are the discussions happening now? Have Israeli officials laid out any potential options for retaliation? There are discussions that are ongoing. There were discussions that were happening between the United States and Israel as the attacks were unfolding. There were discussions that were happening from uh, uh, officials in this building, officials in the White House, and I won't speak to, to the Pentagon, but I would assume by officials at the Pentagon in the immediate aftermath of the attacks, just in the last couple of hours, and those uh, conversations will continue through the rest of the day and, of course, in the days to come. Thank you. Uh, Matt, did the U.S. have any indication whether or not they were successful that the Iranians intended to strike U.S. interests or assets in the region? Uh, I'm going to defer to uh, the Pentagon to speak to specific operational details as to what the Iranians might have been targeting. They're obviously in the best position to monitor that and to speak to it. Uh, so, and I know they're having a briefing later today. I'll defer that question to them. Okay. I mean, we understand that the embassy had all of its employees go home and shelter in place. Just want to confirm that. was that. out of an abundance of caution, knowing that an uh, attack on uh, Tel Aviv might be in the works, and so we took that step out of uh, uh, Tel Aviv and, and um, potentially Jerusalem as well, so we took that step out of an abundance of caution. But in terms of what specific uh, sites Iran was targeting, I will defer to my colleagues at the Pentagon. Okay. In terms of the partners that uh, you mentioned were, were engaged this time, uh, without getting into specifics as to who it was, um, were there fewer partners? Was there less support um, for for their engagement this time around? I think that's, that's still specific. April? Maybe it's a generality. Either way, I'm, not, I'm just not going to get into it, other than say that we did, there were partners that were engaged with us uh, in this defense of Israel, and I will let every country speak to their own participation. Okay. It's not a specific. It's just, I mean... It's more specific than I'm willing to share at this right. point. Um, and, and just to clarify, I understand consultations are ongoing with the Israelis. What is the U.S believe is the right course of action now? A response or diplomacy? So again, I think it is important that we have those conversations with Israel before we read them out publicly. Obviously, we do not want to see this conflict continue to escalate. Uh, that said, we have been clear that there must be consequences for this attack, and I think it's important that we t discuss um, this, the, this issue privately with our partners before we read them out publicly. Okay, and in previous instances, it had become known that the, that part of the way, as you mentioned, the U.S. deterred Iran from taking action was through diplomacy, including the pushing of the potential of ceasefire talks, uh, a potential breakthrough in Gaza. That seems remote now. What is the status of ceasefire talks, either in Gaza or in Lebanon, that the U.S. had been pushing in the weeks prior to these developments? It's a really good question, and I will say, um, I went into some of this detail here yesterday, the, where we are on the ceasefire talks in Gaza is that the terrorist group that Iran funds, Hamas, has been unwilling to come to the table to engage 
the past several weeks. Um, so yes, it's true that we have not been able to advance these ceasefire talks, but it's not because of any lack of effort by the United States or our partners in the region. It's because the terrorist organization that Iran has sponsored for years and years and years has refused to come to the table. So if Iran um, wants to use the breakdown of ceasefire talks as an excuse for uh, its actions today, it needs to point to the terrorist group that it controls. It's Hamas that has been responsible in recent weeks for the breakdown of those talks. Is, is it your understanding that that was one of the reasons that they decided to? No, I was responding okay. to, the, Just, to, the, to the question. No, no. Yeah. Last, last one clarification. I mean, obviously, these talks require time, resources. It engages top uh, U.S. officials. Are they still a worthwhile investment of the U.S.'s time? When it appears that other parties are not no, look, we are going to so we will we are are not going to give up on reaching a ceasefire in Gaza because we believe it is the best way to free the hostages. It is the best way to alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people. It is the best way to ensure long term peace and stability uh, for the entire region. So no, of course we are going to continue to stay engaged on this. But in any kind of ceasefire talks, when you're talking about two parties to a conflict, you need uh, both parties to engage. And right now we have a refusal to engage by one of those parties. Sorry, that's Gaza. And Lebanon as well? Or are you, have you abandoned that? In Lebanon, so look, we ultimately do want to see a ceasefire. We ultimately want to see a diplomatic resolution. But um, as I said yesterday, uh, we do support Israel's right to defend itself against terrorist uh, organizations. Hezbollah has continued to launch terrorist attacks across the board. Um, and Israel's taking steps to defend itself against those attacks. Thank you. And you mentioned there was... A before the attack, you had that you weren't told by the Iranians that they were going to attack, but you had some indication. Um, what was the indication? Was that was that sort of uh, from satellites able to see things moving around? Are you able to tell us anything more about that? So I'm not, I am not able to tell you anymore, unfortunately. Obviously, um, you've seen uh, all around the world before the outbreak of conflicts that the United States at times has the ability to. Um, gather information about what is likely to happen. That was the case here. I certain, I just can't say any more about so, it. But it. But it was not from through any conversations with Iran, right. direct and or indirect. And some some in, a small amount of intelligence was was declassified so that you could make that warning ahead of time. I'm just not. I'm not able to get into it any more than what we said publicly it, already. In that period between informing the world that the and the Israelis that you know of this of this information, um, was there any effort to? other than the public statements to reach out to the Iranians to say, don't do this? So I will answer that by saying we have made clear for some time that we have the ability to send messages to Iran when it is our, in our interest to do so. And without speaking to any messages in particular, we have made clear the position of the United States that Iran should not launch this attack that it would be a mistake for Iran to launch this attack. And I think I'll leave it at that. And the, um, I think the Iranian mission to the UN has talked about, they did send some message, I'm not sure whether it's before, you know, minutes before, after the missiles were launched or, or you yeah. know, is there anything you can tell us about when that was received and sort of the nature of yeah. that message? It, it, it wasn't received because that report's not true. I mean, it's okay. just, I, I have seen the statement from Iran. Uh, I saw first stories that they warned us in advance, then I saw uh, stories that they warned us shortly in advance. It's just not true. We received no advance warning from Iran about this attack. Okay, and, and since the attack... And, 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 uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Yeah. I would just note that this is not the first time that Iran has said things about supposed interactions with the U.S. government and messages it has sent to the U.S. government that have not been true. Um, they have done that a number of times over the last few months, and this is one of those right. examples. And you're saying up till now, up till when you took the podium, I guess, there was no sort of diplomatic note from the Iranians uh, explaining correct. their actions? Correct. Correct. Okay. Just to Even, yeah. on their statement from uh, in the UN, they said that this attack in response to, uh, uh, to the violations for their sovereignty and also attacks against their nationals. Now, sovereignty, the attack uh, uh, on Smail Haniya, on their territories, do you think this is a legitimate argument for them? No, of course it's not. Um, if you look at the you know, supposed uh, argument about attacks on their sovereignty, I will say, first of all, that's an event that happened weeks ago. And what's changed in the weeks since then? You've seen the death of the leader of a terrorist organization that Iran sponsors, funds, controls. That's what's changed. And to the extent that any Iranian officials have been killed um, in the past few days in, in Lebanon or in Syria, it's because they were meeting with terrorist 
organizations, meeting with terrorist leaders, and it goes to the point I made a moment, a moment ago, which is what you saw Iran to do today was come to the defense of a terrorist organization. I don't think it holds water when you look at all the events of this past few week, of the past few weeks that this event had anything to do with Iran's sovereignty. It has to do with the fact that a number of the terrorist organizations that Iran has set up for years as a way to undermine and attack the state of Israel have been weakened first over the past few months and then most recently over the past few weeks. That's, it's quite clear that's what they're responding to. Okay, and one question on Lebanon. I know now everybody is concerned about a widened world, about escalation, but also there are concerns about repercussions in Lebanon. I'm talking about the humanitarian situation, about maybe civil war at some point. So are you talking to, some, are you talking to uh, the Lebanese? What are your concerns? What are you doing? Are you talking to the LAF? You've been supporting the LAF, and yesterday you, you were talking about stability yeah. and their role in the stability in, uh, inside within Lebanon. Who are their pa your partners in Lebanon? So let me speak to, to first, uh, you, you kind of mentioned on, on the way into the question, the humanitarian situation. We are working to address the humanitarian situation uh, in, in Lebanon. I would note that um, the United States has been one of the, if not the largest contributor to humanitarian relief for the Lebanese people uh, going back years, and we will continue to work to provide humanitarian support for the Lebanese people. Um, and we are coordinating with our partners in the region, with their inter international organizations about the shape and nature of those relief efforts, even as we speak. Um, when it comes to the political situation in Lebanon, so um, look, Lebanon has been plagued by instabilities, as I know you know far better than me, for, for some time. And um, not certainly not the only, but one of the driving factors of Lebanon's instability has, had, has been the fact that Hezbollah plays a significant role in the political organization of Lebanon and has held a veto over um, Lebanon's ability to move forward with a new president and has held a veto over the security situation of Lebanese civilians. It's because of Hezbollah's refusal to abide, Hezbollah's refusal to abide with UN Security Council 1701 and actually pull back from the border that, as they were supposed to do, that we're in this situation today. So I think it's too early, obviously, to say what the, how this conflict will shape out in the next few weeks. But what we are going to be working to do is to try to seize this moment and really hope that the Lebanese people can seize this moment against very difficult odds, because there are still a number of Hezbollah fighters who have access to uh, arms and, and equipment inside Lebanon, but seize this moment to try to establish actual political stability for Lebanon. Who do you want? To do that. So look, I'm not, that, that is ultimately a question for the Lebanese people to answer, not for the United States to answer. Um, but when you see the degradation of Hezbollah inside Lebanon, which has been such a destabilizing force uh, to the country, hopefully, hopefully, and I, you can't predict that it's going to happen, but hopefully that's an opportunity for other political actors in Lebanon to step forward. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I mean, in your answer to Matt, and also during this 12 months, you've been always saying that you, your ma your main goal in this conflict is not to for it to spread to a regional war. And I believe now we are maybe one step further from, from it, a regional war. Uh, but uh, do you think that your, your way of trying to contain it through your diplomatic means by drawing boundaries and lines to Israel, that if you cross this, this will escalate into this war or that war, and the Israeli prime ministers keep crossing those lines, keeps escalating in the, in the region, whether it is in, in Gaza with the uh, Philadelphia Corridor or in Lebanon. First, the, 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 you, you uh, advised against major operation in Lebanon, it happened. You advised against uh, uh, ground incursions in Lebanon. It happened, and now we reach to this point. Do, do you think that he's dragging the United States into a regional war, as he was saying that, that he wants to do that for a long time now? So let me say for, uh, a couple things about this. First, it is absolutely true that Israel makes its own decisions about its security and uh, about its path forward in the region. And that's true about Israel, but it's true about every other country in the region. Um, the United States offers its advice, it offers its support, 
It offers its deterrence capabilities. It offers its diplomatic capabilities to our partners. But ultimately, our partners and our allies have to make their own decisions about their future. And the United States has to make its own decisions about our national interests. And I know that's what the state of Israel does and what they will continue to do. And we will continue to make um, our own decisions about our national interests. And the decisions that we have made that we will continue to stand by and continue to pursue is to use our diplomacy and deterrence to try and avert a regional war. We're, we're, we're going to continue to do that. But it's always been true that there are a number of other players in the region besides the United States. It's Israel, it's terrorist organizations, there are other countries in the region, all of whom have agency in this question. And what we will continue to do is use our diplomacy, use our deterrence to try to achieve the best outcome possible. But don't, don't you see that maybe you are enabling the Israelis to seek, what do you say, their own interests and in, in their own way of thinking? by risking or going against your interest as the United States of going toward a regional war. So they are going to make their decisions. We are going to make decisions about our interests. But if you look at the, the questions that have been before us the past few days and the questions that got us to where we are today, we're here responding to an Iranian attack that we, along with Israel, Israel primarily were able to successfully defeat, that Iran launched because Israel has taken out Terrorist organization, a terrorist organization, the leaders of a terrorist organization. And that's something we support them doing. So while there are certainly steps that Israel takes with which we do not agree, and we have been quite clear about that, we do support them taking out the leaders of a terrorist organization. We support them degrading a terrorist organization. Those are steps that the United States would take as well. Those are steps that Arab countries in the region would take. Doesn't mean we always agree with the way that they do it but we fully recognize their right to do it, and we're going to continue to have conversations with them about the best way, be, best way forward. Uh, the, my last question is just, there's some statements coming from Tehran that they waited so long after Hania was assassinated in Tehran because they received uh, messages from the United States that something will happen regarding the ceasefire in Gaza, and this maybe will give them a way of not responding to Israel, and this didn't happen. Did you give them this message? So we made clear through a number of diplomatic channels. I'm not going to talk about our direct communications with Iran, as I never do, but we did make clear through a number of diplomatic channels that the situation in the region was very tense and that the ceasefire talks were at a very delicate nature, um, and Iran should not do anything to upset those talks. Now, what's happened in the meantime? Obviously, there's been a lot of, been a lot of water under the bridge since that date, but if you look at what's happened in the past few weeks, it has been Iran's client terrorist organization that has been the impediment to reaching a ceasefire agreement, which is not to say that there have not been times in which Israel has made reaching an agreement more difficult. They absolutely have, and we have been trying to work through those objections as well. But in the past few weeks, it's Iran's, it's the terrorist organization that Iran supports that has refused to come to the table to talk about how to get a final agreement. So, Saeed. Thank you. You're saying that Hamas has rejected or Hamas is obstinate about the ceasefire talks. I just want to understand what you're saying. Yeah, so it, it is, so to be clear, I, I went through some of this site yesterday, yeah. and I know you were, you were uh, out. Everybody's, everybody's allowed. Sorry about that. And no, no, everybody's allowed a day off. Um, so obviously this has been a long and winding road trying to get an agreement over the finish line. Um, if you look at the events since the president put forward a public proposal on May 31st, and then um, later, I think it was in August, where he presented a bridging proposal to both parties that narrowed the differences down to a final few, few um, uh, provisions that we were trying to work through. Obviously, there were things where we wanted to see Israel make tough decisions, and there were places we wanted to see Hamas make tough decisions. And we thought we had been making progress on narrowing those differences and having a proposal that would bridge the final differences between the two parties. And then in the past few weeks, Hamas just stopped engaging with the mediators, with okay. Egypt and Qatar. So um, right now, which is not to say that there aren't, diff as I said in response to one of the other questions, not to say that Israel, if we can get back on track, doesn't have difficult decisions to make. They will have difficult decisions to make, and we will be pushing them to make those <coughs> difficult decisions. But right now, and for the past few weeks, it's been Hamas being unwilling to engage in any meaningful way with the mediators that has kept these uh, kept us moving toward kept us from moving towards an agreement. 
Yeah. But a couple, couple of things. Can we just Has Israel engaged in a meaningful way we in have the been last week? We have been engaging. So they we have, never responded when you guys put forth that proposal for a 21-day ceasefire. So we're so let's keep things separate. We're talking about the ceasefire proposal yeah. in in Gaza okay. right now. They have been engaging with us on a meaningful way. I can talk about that. Okay. When okay. Sorry, I can come back and talk about that about the. the That's what you're talking about. We're talking about the proposal in Gaza. Just to follow up, although Hamas did accept. Uh, the proposal, as was suggested by the president, so, on May 31, they accepted it. Just to be Israel. clear, before you and go in fact, on the question, it's not accurate. Saying, it's not accurate. They keep saying we accept it wholly. I know they didn't. Okay. I can tell you, having okay. looked at the text of the, of the original proposal and looked okay. at the text of the response, okay. they accepted some provisions and po uh, uh, proposed changes to yeah. others. That's yeah. not an acceptance; that is a negotiation. Yeah, yeah. but you know, a couple of things uh, on this point. I mean, you mentioned that Israel has a right to go after terrorist leaders and kill them and so on. Israel has been doing this for decades. They've killed scores of Palestinian leaders, scores of Lebanese leaders and so on over, over the years. Has that in any way really listened? The conflict resolved the issue, brought peace to the region, arrived at a at, at resolution of the conflict? There is do, you, do you believe, I'm just, you know, do you believe that what Israel is doing now is basically it makes it safer? There has been a long history of violence right. um, in the Middle East. Decades and decades of violence. And you have heard the Secretary talk about one of the things we would like to accomplish is to break that cycle of violence and ultimately reach resolutions to establish an independent Palestinian state, which of course is um, uh, the absence of which fuels much of the insecurity in the region. Um, we would like to see Israel normalize its relationships with its neighbors. But in the meantime, that does not mean that Israel should not defend itself against terrorists that are committed on killing its civilians and destroying its state. Any country would do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask you, uh, just shift gears on, on, on the aid issue. Uh, ProPublica published a, a report saying that uh, Israel deliberately blocked humanitarian aid to Gaza, and there were two U.S. government bodies that told that to the Secretary of State, but he, he basically rejected it. And in fact, he told uh, Congress that he uh, that in fact Israel was allowing it to go on. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I will, and I'm glad you asked me uh, this question because I think there have been a lot of misperceptions about what happened that I do want to clear up. So, it is not at all uncommon when the United States government is looking at difficult questions for different agencies inside the United States government to come to differing conclusions or different bureaus and components inside an agency to come to differing conclusions. And that's what happened here. You had different, uh, you had a number of components of the department that were making recommendations. You had other agencies inside the U.S. government outside the State Department who were providing information to the Secretary. And when the Secretary got all those recommendations in a number of meaningful ways, that they conflicted. You had some people making uh, one set of recommendations and other people making, uh, if not diametrically opposed recommendations, recommendations that conflicted. And so that's not an unusual thing. That happens all the time when making difficult decisions. And so what the secretary did is what we always try to do, which is to sift through those conflicting uh, recommendations, look at the underlying information, and make the best judgments we can. And the judgment that we ultimately made, if you read the National Security Memorandum, and I think a lot of this has been lost by people who have forgotten in the months since it was released what it said. That, that report was quite clear in identifying that there were a number of steps that Israel had taken or not taken that had led to the hindrance of humanitarian aid being delivered to Gaza, and that we were quite concerned about those steps. But in the meantime, they had implemented a number of additional measures that we had recommended to them to improve the delivery of humanitarian <clears throat> assistance. And it is looking at all of those factors together, where the situation had been and where it had gone, that led the secretary to come to the conclusion that he made. So it is far more complicated than the kind of uh, uh, headline or tweet version of this, of this situation that I know often gets uh, written up. I will say, the final thing I will say about that is, this is an ongoing situation where we constantly monitor the situation, identify deficiencies, engage with the government of Israel, engage with the UN humanitarian partners in the region to try to correct those deficiencies, uh, and then move forward. And our assessments, because we're not done making those assessments, will continue.
No yeah, Tom, go. Oh, yeah. Good, just a specific follow up on that. You, you talked about these uh, different parts of the State Department making different recommendations. In the ProPublica story, and, and, and I guess we know about this from, from the NSM, but the, if, you, if you were going to look at look to parts of the US government to tell you on the specific question of whether a country is uh, blocking the delivery of humanitarian aid, wouldn't you look to USAID and PRM in this building? Aren't they the two exactly the two parts of the government that you would ask that question? So I would look to them. I would also look to our experts in the region, our experts in the bureaus that cover the region, as well as other US government agencies. And that's what we did. And without speaking to the recommendation of any individual component, any individual bureau or agency, because it wouldn't be appropriate for me to do that, the secretary got conflicting recommendations and had to resolve those. Doesn't it suggest, and isn't the secretary's decision based on recommendations, he's taken this, the expert recommendation of, on that specific humanitarian question and considered it looking at the political and so, strategic other, other influences and made a decision. But the actual technical advice from the two agencies involved in that specifically was that so, they are blocking it. So this is not a comment about the, the question, but I, it is a comment about some of the criticism that the secretary has received. One of the things that I have found over the years in, my, in government is when there are conflicting reports, the side that had the opinion that you agreed with was the expert side, and the other side was a bunch of political hacks. And that is always the way that people, people uh, interpret these. We look at it as well, all, all, of the, all of these officials who made recommendations had expertise, and the secretary valued all of their expertise equally, and ultimately took their recommendations, but also dived into the underlying facts and dived into not just looking backwards months and months and months, but what this, the, the change in the situation and the change in the delivery of humanitarian assistance when we made that assessment and found that to be just as important as the events that had happened uh, uh, in the previous months. And the report's language reflected all of that. We were quite transparent about how we had seen the situation change over time. Uh, wait, wait a second. I don't understand how you can say the secretary valued all their expertise equally when he rejected <laughs> the, 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 the side that... He, 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 so you can value someone's expertise and still and disagree with... Uh, uh, yeah, I value very much your reporting, Matt. I disagree with some of the stories that you write. You can value <laughs> well, first someone, of all, I question, you can, the, I question that. You can, but, you but, can value but, someone's but expertise all. and still disagree at times with their recommendations when you have conflicting information. It's just well, wait, so there was conflicting information? You had, that conflicting, suggested you had that, conflicting assessments from different bureaus inside yeah, the department. Okay, but assessments were based on facts on the ground, right? They were based what, on... What, right? They were, what, what, was, what was happening on the ground? So it's not just... So unless one of these two bureaus just got it wrong it, and didn't... Then it is, they were giving their... No. It is, they, their, their assessment was based on the facts, No, right? it is not just uh, the assessment of facts on the ground, but how facts changed over time, which is one of the things we laid out in the report, <laughs> that if you looked at the actions by the government of Israel and as important as actions at time in action, things that we had recommended yeah. they do that they didn't take, um, we concluded that some of the actions they took and some of the inactions, things that they hadn't done, had led to a slowdown in delivery of humanitarian assistance. But right. we had intervened with them, and they had, had taken a number of meaningfully... Uh, meaningful steps in another direction that led us to make the assessment that we did. To the point where now everything is just fine. That was a, this, right. As I said, it is an ongoing assessment and we constantly see deficiencies right. that we try to uh, alleviate. The situation is nowhere close to fine. <clears throat> yeah. On the Israeli raids into <clears throat> Lebanon, just first of all, I mean, do you have any updates on your assessment of what's happening in the ground if these remain limited as has been described? So as of today, um, we have continued to see limited targeted raids. Um, I won't speak to the future, but that's what we've seen as of this point. And um, I think the Israelis have spoken about these going back some way in time as well, actually. Is that your understanding that they have been... You know, they were going on to the world before. I think with that level of detail, I should, uh, about a military operation, I should defer to them to speak. Okay, and I, on the, you talked about this combination of deterrence and diplomacy, So when, and, and you're going to be consulting with the Israelis in terms of the response to Iran. Are both of those things that you're talking about important in your discussions with the Israelis now, both deterrence and diplomacy? Uh, of course, they always are. Okay, and on the point about... Um, I just, I just wanted to sort of get you to reflect on where you were at last week at the United Nations, a joint call with a number of countries uh, uh, urging restraint, de-escalation, a 21-day truce. 
where we are now and what we've just seen happening in the region, how, when you reflect on sort of what has changed or what went wrong, if I can put it like that, for your own uh, s strategic position, what, what is the reason behind the complete difference in what you're aspiring to last week and where we're at now? So nothing has changed in what we're aspiring to. We continue to um, see excuse me, a ceasefire and a diplomatic res resolution as a best way forward to the conflict in the North. Um, at the same time, events that have happened over the past few weeks, like the death of Hassan Nasrallah, is the kind of event that we support, right? We want to see terrorists brought to justice um, and uh, attacks on terrorists, attacks on terrorist infrastructure to um, both, um, to both stop them from launching these rocket attacks against Israeli civilians, and as I said in response to Heba's question, to um, try to degrade what has been a destabilizing force for Lebanon and the Lebanese people. Um, we support those actions, but long term, ultimately, we do want to see a diplomatic resolution, and that starts with a ceasefire, and we're continuing to pursue that with Israel and um, uh, our partners in the region. And when you said just finally that, I think, which I don't think I've heard you say before, but you described Israel as expanding the conflict in these actions, and you also then said that doesn't, you talked about the death of Nasrallah, and um, perhaps we're also alluding to Hania, I don't know, but um, when you said that terrorists are killed, it doesn't mean we always agree with the way they do it. Is that is that something you'd apply to either of these cases? It's not a comment I'm going to make with any specific um, uh, for any specific strike because as we've gotten into a number of times, there are num there are, uh, when it comes to those types of assessments, a number of factors we have to consider. But I think it's true when you look at um, any government that launches military operations. We might look at it sometimes and come to different decisions, either for tactical reasons or strategic ones. Um, Jillian, go ahead. Uh, Stop Ed in Foreign Affairs today. He writes the Biden administration's uh, about the Middle East. The strategy has put the U.S. in a much stronger geopolitical position today than it was four years ago, given what you just laid out. All the encouragement from the U.S. towards Iran not to launch, you know, escalatory strikes. It seems. Uh, unfortunate timing. Uh, no, I think when you look at the position that the United States was in when President Biden took office, um, we were on the defensive around the world. The United States had squandered alliances, partnerships, friendships. We um, uh, were pulling back in our engagements in Europe, in Asia, <clears throat> in the Middle East. People didn't know whether they could count on the United States or not. And what the secretary lays out in that article, which I do commend to everyone's uh, readership, um, is the series of steps that we have taken around the world to rebuild those alliances and partnerships to confront uh, powers who have a different vision of the world than we do. And I'll also note that one of the things the secretary always hears in his travels through the Middle East, and I've witnessed this firsthand, is countries in the region welcoming U.S. engagement, wanting to see continued U.S. engagement, um, and oftentimes saying, you are the only country that can play this diplomatic role. There's no other country in the region or the world that can play a, a role in trying to de-escalate this conflict, and so they want us to, to stay at it, and we'll continue to stay at it. So then why wasn't the U.S., the Biden administration, able to dissuade Iran from launching today's attack. Look, I think you. Iran has um, taken, uh, has, has funded terrorist groups, has launched attacks on uh, interests in the region going back decades. If you look at what happened in the pre under the previous administration's watch, Iran launched missile attacks directly at U.S. soldiers that led to traumatic brain injuries for more than 100 U.S. soldiers. So Iran has been, being, has been a destabilizing force going back years, including during the previous administration. What we will do is continue to hold them accountable. Let me take one more, and then I'm going to wrap for today. On the question about the partners that you don't want to name, uh, last time you did talk about coalition of countries you put together, the UK, the Gulf countries, Jordan. The fact that we are not hearing about the same coalition, is it because of the lack of timing to get all the ducks in a row? I just don't want to say any more about the partners uh, uh, that we engage other than they should speak for themselves. Could could you you time? Mm? Sorry. I just wanted, could you say whether it's larger or smaller or the same I, size? I, I, I don't want, I just can't speak to it at all. I also have a hard time yeah, understanding your, 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 definition, your definition of what's happening today. You said that Iran is supporting in defending the terrorist organization by attacking another country with ballistic missiles without any warning. If this is not an act of war, then what is it? 
So let me just go back to what I said today, which is that Israel, with help from the United States and partners, was able to defeat this attack, and we're going to consult with them on the days forward. Let me go to Nike. I said I'd be last, but Nike, one more, and then I have, I have some, some closing comments. That I want. Thank you. Uh, so on Afghanistan, quickly, uh, we saw the statement regarding Tom West's transition from the special representative for Afghanistan to um, office on sanctions coordination. Uh, what does this mean for U.S. policy toward Afghanistan? Is Afghanistan a U.S. foreign policy priority? Of course it is, and we will continue to stay engaged um, uh, on Afghanistan. It remains an enduring priority. The work will now be led within the State Department by the Chief of Mission of the U.S. Mission to Afghanistan, Karen Decker, Special Envoy Amiri, and Ambassador John Mark Palmersheim. I have a quick and, and then if you'll, if you'll bear with me for, for one moment, because there were, there were comments that I wanted to make at the top that um, uh, I wasn't able to, to have a, uh, a little bit of an announcement. We are pleased to announce that as of today, the daily press briefings at the Department of State will include American Sign Language interpretation. This is in addition to the live captioning we provide online. The team of daily press briefing interpreters includes certified deaf interpreters, ensuring more accurate, nuanced interpretation for the deaf and hard of hearing community. The interpretation reflects our commitment to deaf and hard of hearing inclusion and our overall values, that everyone has equitable access to the information they need. Many offices at the department worked over a significant period of time to make this important step a reality. Today's action underscores the department's commitment to inclusion and our acknowledgement that all individuals are integral to the fabric